So we're going to talk about uh, polar covalent bonds and dipoles. This will get us ready for our discussion and our work in class. And so let's jump right in and talk about what we're going to learn. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about covalent bonding versus ionic bonding. Uh, then we're going to talk about electronegativity and induction, which is which leads us to the discussion about polar covalent bonds. And uh, after talking about polar covalent bonds, we're going to talk about dipoles and how you can have individual atomic dipoles as well as molecular dipoles. And then we'll talk about some cases where there are no dipoles uh, in the case of something being symmetrical or dipoles canceling out or the molecule just not having any polar covalent bonds present. So let's jump in. There are two types of bonding, and I have bonding in quotes because when we talk about ionic bonds, they're not really bonds in the sense of overlapping orbitals. Uh, an ionic bond is more like an electrostatic attraction between uh, two atoms that have the opposite charge. So you have the example here. We have sodium and chlorine, or sodium chloride. Right. And sodium is positive. Chlorine is negative. And so when those two atoms are close enough together, uh, they are attracted to each other's charge. And because of that, uh, they just kind of hang out in what we call an electrostatic attraction. But if it's an ionic attraction, there are no orbitals overlap. Right. This is strictly based on the fact that one atom has a positive charge. The other atom has a negative charge. So the other type of bond um, that we'll discuss is what we call a covalent bond covalent meaning shared valence or we, we when we think about valence we know that it's the outer shared electrons that participate in bonding and so covalent means shared valence or overlapping valence so covalent bond happens when you have two atoms uh that have orbitals that overlap uh, those between those two atoms those electrons are shared so in this example these two atoms come collide with one another the orbitals overlap add together and now you have a covalent bond with electrons between the two atoms. Notice the position of the electrons is uh, basically equidistant between both atoms, and we're going to talk about that in a second as to why that's important. Right, so the position of the electrons is equidistant between the two atoms, the orbitals are overlapping, and the distance between the atoms or the bond length is the optimal distance uh, that's necessary for a bond to occur. All right, so let's keep going. So now we, let's talk about what happens if you have two atoms that are different in electronegativity. You, you remember the electronegativity trend from GChem, where electronegativity increases from left to right across the periodic table and bottom to top, with fluorine being the most electronegative atom on the periodic table. And so when you have atoms that come together that have different electronegativity, there's a different dynamic as it relates to the bonding and the sharing of electrons. So let's talk about that. So first of all, if, if the bond is nonpolar covalent, right, you have two atoms, orbitals overlapping, and the electrons are shared equally. Again, they're equidistant between each atom because the uh, electronegativity difference between the atoms is not great enough to cause that pair of electrons to favor one atom over the other. But there are also, there's also a case for what we call polar covalent bonds. And a polar covalent bond is a bond where the electrons are unequally shared between the two atoms. And the reason for that is because there's a difference in electronegativity between one atom or the other. So when we look at this carbon and chlorine forming a bond, they come in, the orbitals overlap, the orbitals add together, and then we have a covalent bond. Notice the position of the electrons and the position of the electrons favor chlorine. Right. And that's because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. We can predict how we classify a bond. Right. If, if the difference in electronegativity delta EN is uh, zero to 0 0.49, we consider that bond nonpolar covalent. If it's 0 0.5 to 1.7, we consider it uh, polar covalent. And then if it's greater than 1.8, then we consider it ionic. And so we're able to classify bonds based on this chart and based on the different difference in electronegativity between the two atoms that are in the bond. So one of the other consequences of polar covalent bonds is, is this concept of creating what we call dipoles, right? So if the bond is polar covalent and then the, if the electrons are heavily favored towards the more electronegative atom, what that creates is polarization in the bond. 
That polarization, we call that the inductive effect, where one atom is able to polarize the bond and create these partial charges shown here, where if the electrons are moving towards chlorine, remember electrons have a negative charge. So if they move towards chlorine, that makes chlorine partially negative. And by default, the other atom in the bond becomes partially positive, right? Anytime you take negative charge away from an atom, that atom becomes more positive. Right. And that what that induction creates is what we call a dipole. And the dipole is indicated by this red arrow shown here. That red arrow tells me the flow of electrons within the bond. Right. So the arrow points towards the more electronegative atom. It always points towards the greedier atom as it relates to electrons. All right. So these polar covalent bonds are identified by their dipoles. Right. Every polar covalent bond is going to have a dipole in the direction of the most electronegative atom. Here's some examples. So let's look at the CO bond here in this ether, right? You can see that the dipole is moving away from carbon and towards oxygen on both sides. And that, that's indicative of the fact that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, right? Let's look at the other example. You see here where the fluorine and the chlorine, those dipoles, the, the dipole is going towards fluorine and towards chlorine because both atoms are more electronegative than carbon. In the carbonyl here, right, you see that there's a huge dipole actually between carbon and oxygen. This is a very polarized molecule because of the fact that there's a lot of charge separation between that carbon and that oxygen. And then over here, this, this fourth example, notice all the dipoles are going in opposite directions. And so we're gonna talk about that later, but there are dipoles because each one of these bonds is polarized towards the more electronegative atom. So these individual atomic dipoles are always present in a bond where one atom is more electronegative than the other atom. Those atomic dipoles can uh, actually add together to form a sum because a dipole is a vector, right? It has magnitude and it has direction. So those dipoles can actually add together, right? If you notice here in this uh, example where the fluorine dipole is going uh, one way, the, the chlorine dipole is going one way, but if you sum them together, you get a net direction of how the electrons are flowing in this molecule. So that net direction is what we call a net dipole or molecular dipole. And th th these molecular dipoles occur when vectors, the dipole vectors add together to give you an overall direction of electron flow. All right, take uh, acetone for instance. The, uh, the carbon oxygen bond is polarized. Right. And and so are the carbon carbon bonds because the carbonyl carbon shown here is sp2 hybridized and is more electronegative than the the uh, methyl carbons on the outside, which are sp3 hybridized. And so that little bit of induction from the sp2 carbon is going to polarize the carbon carbon bonds towards the carbonyl carbon, which is shown here. And the carbon oxygen bond is also polarized. And so the overall direction or the net direction of the dipole would be indicated by this arrow shown here. All right. So you have individual dipoles uh, between atoms. And then that is also possible for those individual dipoles to sum together as vectors to give you an overall dipole. All right. There are also cases where there are there is no dipole. Right. If a molecule is symmetrical like CO2, there's not going to be a dipole. If a molecule is like the uh, carbon tetrachloride that we have shown here, that molecule is not going to show a dipole because these two dipoles are going to cancel each other out because they have the same magnitude, but they're going in different directions. And these two dipoles are going to cancel because they have the same magnitude, but they're going in different directions. Another case where there is no dipole is that if there's a, just no polar covalent bond, right? The CH bonds around carbon are all polarized towards carbon, but the, the individual dipoles are too weak to give you an overall net dipole. So if, for this type of molecule where there are, no, there are no real polar covalent bonds, you won't see a dipole moment. All right, so here are the conclusions. So covalent bonding versus ionic bonding, we talked about that. Remember, covalent bonding involves orbital overlap. Ionic bonding does not. Uh, we talked about the electronegativity of atoms causing induction or polarization of a bond. We, and that led us to discuss polar covalent bonds. And then we also talked about dipoles, that you can have individual atomic dipoles, as well as overall molecular or net dipoles. And we, we finished up talking about cases where there are no dipoles.
So with that being said, we'll conclude the video. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me uh, using the information shown on the screen. Peace.